Please note everyone in attendance that today's meeting is being live streamed on the ncpc.gov website. We do have a quorum and noting the quorum uh, without objection we will proceed with the agenda as has been publicly um, advertised. Um, uh, the agenda item number one is the report of the chairman. I'd just like to note that uh, Patrick Hardeby has joined us from the Chairman Chaffetz's office. Welcome. Happy to have you here. And <clears throat> I'll note that I'll remind you that in our April meeting we um, re-elected officers and um, Vice Chairman Dixon was re-elected, but he was absent for his coronation. So <laughs> you want to you want to say just a word about uh, the happy occasion of your absence? Well, I, I tried to uh, uh, circulate the document, which wouldn't require words from me in time. But I have a uh, uh, an award that's been given now four years in the name of my brother, James W. Dixon, who was killed in a plane crash as an Air Force a aviator in 1964. So I go to Penn State each year and offer that award. Uh, he was uh, 22 when he passed, and he was given the award because of the fact that he was the first minority black commander of the Air Force ROTC unit at Penn State. And at that time, it was the largest in the United States. Over 1,000 cadets were under his command. Uh, and that award is given to an outstanding uh, uh, ROTC person. And this particular occasion was special because it was a young woman who has already got a seat. Uh, she's a pilot, and she's already got a seat, which is competitive nationally now, and also is the chairman or captain of her soccer team, which was a statewide uh, winner. And the last four have been equally as, 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 as uh, outstanding. So a little more said than I thought, but uh, that's why I was absent. And uh, because, as you all some know, I'm a retired 06 colonel. Uh, I show up and uh, support the cause. So that was my reason for being gone. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, thank you for your vote. <laughs> As well. I, I, have to, I have to laugh and say that I have won a few contests, and a number of them, the better ones, I, some of the better ones I've won, I have been absent. <laughs> and this may be one of them. For example, being elected National Committee Man, all kinds of things. I was away on military duty. When the vote went down, the election day and the week was, and I managed. So there may be a message here. I don't know. <laughs> thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I missed it. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Dixon. Uh, agenda item number two is the report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've had a very busy month at NCPC with a number of public events, including two FBI J. Edgar Hoover Square Gullite. Square Guidelines meetings and a very interesting speaker series event with Patricia Brown from London just last week. And many thanks to the members of the public who attended these events. I'd also like to extend our thanks to uh, Commissioner Rhodes for hosting yesterday's uh, annual briefing between NCPC and the Department of Defense District Commanders. Uh, this was our sixth annual meeting and it was very, very productive. So thank you very much for organizing that. Uh, tomorrow, on uh, Friday, May 6, NCPC is coordinating a panel discussion at the Makeover Montgomery Three Conference in Silver Spring. Julie Costa will moderate the Future of Suburban Federal Office Park session, and Commissioner Wright from the GSA's Office of Planning and Qu uh, Design Quality will also serve as one of the panels. So thank you very much for participating in that. Uh, we hope that members of the public who are participating in the conference will be able to attend. And that concludes my report. You have a written document in front of you. Any questions of uh, Mr. Acosta or any item in the report? Hearing none, thank you. Um, agenda item number three is the legislative update. Uh, General Counsel, Ms. Schuyler. All quiet on the legislative front. I have nothing to report. Good. Agenda item number four is the consent calendar, and we have one item on the consent calendar, and that is item 4A. It's the approval of comments for the District of Columbia Office of the Mayor regarding the district's capital improvement plan for fiscal years 2017 to 2022. So moved. It's been moved and seconded. It's been moved. It's been seconded. Any discussion? All in favor of uh, the consent, consent calendar say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Passed. Agenda item 5A is the cons concept design plans to rehabilitate Arlington Memorial Bridge and is brought to us by way of the National Park Service as the applicant, and Mr. Fliss is with us.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, the National Park Service has submitted concept plans for, re for the rehabilitation of the Arlington uh, Memorial Bridge for your review and comment. Arlington Memorial Bridge is only one of five bridges that connect Virginia with the District of Columbia. It's highlighted here in red on the screen in front of you. The bridge is located in southwest Washington, D.C. and spans the Potomac River, uh, connecting the Lincoln Memorial to the east with the Arlington uh, Memorial Cemetery to the west. Here are some images of the bridge from a variety of perspectives. On the left, you can see the view down the bridge from the Lincoln Memorial looking towards Arlington National Cemetery with Arlington House in the distance. On the right is a view of the bridge from near river level, which shows some of the major elements of the bridge design. The bridge is over 2,000 feet long and 94 feet wide. It includes 10 concrete arch approach spans and a double leaf bascule span at the center. This span was at one time operable and would allow larger ships to travel upstream to Georgetown. Two smaller arches span across Ohio Drive and the George Washington Memorial Parkway on either end of the bridge. The bridge today, as you're probably aware, is a major transportation corridor. It includes sidewalks on both sides, which are used by countless pedestrians and bicyclists every day. And the road includes six 10-foot travel lanes, which carry, carry nearly uh, 70,000 vehicles a day. The project scope, which we'll talk about today, includes the rehabilitation of the entire bridge, including both the concrete spans as well as the bascule span. In terms of its history, the bridge uh, had been contemplated at that location since the uh, early 1830s. Ultimately, it was the work of the Macmillan Commission that advanced the concept of a memorial bridge to symbolically link the north and south in its present location and alignment. The architectural firm of McKim, Mead, and White was selected to design the bridge in 1923, and it was later completed in 1932. The drawbridge continued to operate until the 1960s, at which time it was determined to be no longer necessary, primarily due to the construction of downstream bridges. In 1962, the Army Corps of Engineers published, and the Coast Guard later reaffirmed that the drawbridge need not open. Uh, the bridge was later placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. This bridge is important for a variety of reasons. First, of course, as a memorial, symbolically affirming the reunification of the North and South, and as a part of, larger, as a part of the larger Memorial Avenue corridor, which includes a number of commemorative works. Architecturally, it is often considered uh, Washington's most beautiful bridge, a neoclassical design that successfully captures the monumentality of nation's capital while, gr while gracefully spanning the Potomac Riverscape. In this view of the central bascule span, you can see the granite clad abutments with bas relief eagles, along with the detailed pressed steel facade of the two span leaves. Underneath, you can somewhat make out the detailed truss work of the bridge. The engineering achievements of the bridge are also well recognized. Among other things, at 216 feet, it was once the longest span in the world as well as the heaviest and the fastest. It was also the first of its kind to have all the operable components of the bascule concealed under the bridge and the abutments. This is a view looking up underneath the bascule span today from the river level. Um, in the image, you can see the existing steel truss work and the operator's room located near the bottom of the image. Much of the bridge, bridge's unique design is captured in these engineering drawings showing the major components. Many of, much of this is not visible nor accessible to the public today. Here are some additional images of the bridge operator's room and some of the equipment which would be retained in the alternatives we'll walk through today. As I mentioned, the bascule has not operated since the 1960s, and its closure was affirmed by several agencies. Just for reference, downstream on the Potomac, the Long Bridge actually has a lower clearance than the Arlington Memorial Bridge by about 12 feet. As such, the opening of the bridge is not necessary in the future, and the alternatives show the span is fixed in place. In terms of its current condition, the Memorial Bridge faces a number of challenges. Um, the bridge was listed as structurally deficient in its most recent inspection, primarily due to severe corrosion of the steel in the bascule span and some missing support stringers and framing. Uh, and these are some of the images uh, from recently. The bridge's sidewalks show delamination and spalling of the concrete surface and displacement of the gran granite curbs, while significant deterioration was noted in the concrete of the arch spans, several of which are deficient as well. 
Ongoing evaluations of the bridge have determined that this deterioration continues to accelerate. Another challenge with the existing bridge design is the uh, bridge deck and sidewalk joined. These two, are two, these two elements are two separate structural systems with a joint between them. As you can see in this section through the bridge deck, water that runs off the road surface hits the curb and then can migrate between a seam down the structure, leading to further corrosion. If a, a bridge were constructed today, this would be avoided by allowing the deck to span the entire surface with the sidewalk sitting on top. Um, several temporary measures have been implemented to address some of these concerns, including repairs as, as well as weight restrictions. However, a more lasting rehabilitation is necessary. As such, the purpose of the project is to restore the structural integrity of the bridge while protecting and preserving its memorial character and significant design elements. Again, the scope of the project includes, includes the rehabilitation of the entire bridge, including both the concrete spans as well as the bascule span. However, the potential for the most significant and visible changes were to occur at the bascule span itself. On April 15th of this year, the draft environmental assessment for the project was released for a 30-day public comment period. The EA evaluates the no action alternative and four action alternatives. I will walk you through the action alternatives in this order, highlighting the major elements and any differences among them. Um, and then I will end with the NPS preferred alternative, which is 1B. Staff has analyzed the alternatives using several planning considerations, recognizing that the project must balance historic preservation and design, transportation, as well as the visitor's experience. All of the alternatives incorporate several common elements. These include repair of the bridge piers, foundations and bearings, repair of the concrete arch spans, and replacement of the bridge deck and expansion joints. In addition, it includes the restoration and reinstallation of the metal uh, facade of the bascule span. Um, this is important because the facade of the bascule would not change under any of the alternatives. Um, given this, I think it's important to point out that the majority of bridge users and visitors, for, for majority of users and visitors, the general character and aesthetics of the bridge will not change under any of the alternatives. Views of the bridge from the shore or from a distance will not be changed significantly. As I mentioned previously, the project includes the entire bridge. However, the, most potential, the potential for the most significant and visible changes would occur at the bascule. As such, the alternatives generally focus on this component. Um, it is these changes which I will walk through, recognizing that they will likely only be visible, visible to a limited number of people um, very close to or underneath the bridge. And again, just as a reminder, this is an image of the existing bascule span. You can generally see the uh, truss work of the bridge at the perimeter and the general arch form across the water. Um, as we walk through the alternatives, uh, we'll be looking at views that are taken basically from underneath the, the, the span looking up. In alternative 1A, uh, the existing uh, bascule span would be replaced with a new fixed span comprised of straight precast concrete girders. The sides of the new span would include a truss design that's visually similar to the existing bridge, and the existing steel facade, as I mentioned earlier, would be removed, refurbished, and replaced. The initial construction cost of this alternative is around $225 million. For all the alternatives, I'll show the proposed design next to the um, existing bridge for comparison purposes. For alternative 1A, you can see the underside of the replacement span would not replicate the form or construction of the existing bridge. Views from under the bridge would <coughs> clearly be altered. And because the material and design approach is not sympathetic to the existing bridge, staff recommends the commission not support alternative 1A due to the use of a concrete straight span as compared to the existing steel arch design. And the change in materials form, and in some ways, the oversimplification over simplification of design really fails to speak to the history, character, or en engineering of the existing bridge. Moving to alternative two, the existing bascule span would be replaced with a new fixed span comprised of welded steel trusses that would visually replicate the existing bridge. Um, the existing steel facade would be removed, refurbished, and replaced as well. The initial construction cost of this alternative is around $280 million. In this alternative, the underside of the replacement span would visually replicate the existing bridge. 
However, the de this design would also replicate some of the existing maintenance issues due to the large number of uh, large number and complexity of structural elements, uh, as well as joints. We'd also need to address the sidewalk and jet, uh, deck joint issue mentioned previously. As such, staff recommends the commission note that alternative two would visually replicate the existing bridge. However, it would also replicate some of the maintenance challenges faced currently. In alternative three, the existing bascule would be replaced, uh, repaired in place with steel members uh, replaced as appropriate due to their deterioration. New structural members would be bolted and the existing steel facade on the span would be removed and refurbished. The initial construction cost of this alternative is around $260 million. Again, the underside, underside of the replacement span would look visually similar to today's condition. However, staff notes that the 2015 inspection revealed that approximately 20 to 25% of the existing steel was no longer usable. In addition, given the number of steel members in the existing assembly, many areas may not be accessed for cleaning and may continue to corrode, leading to future maintenance and repair challenges. It would also be challenged to address the sidewalk and deck joint, which continues to allow water to migrate down the structure. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the accelerating deterioration of the structure, as identified by recent inspections, suggests increasing risks under this alternative. As such, staff recommends the commission note that alternative three would preserve elements of the existing bridge. However, the continued challenge of maintaining and repairing the existing span design may lead to more substantial operational issues over time. Finally, in alternative 1B, <clears throat> the existing bascule span would be replaced with a new fixed span comprised of variable depth or arched steel girders. The sides of the new span would include a truss design that is visually similar to the existing bascule span, and the existing steel facade would also be removed and refurbished. This alternative is preferred by the National Park Service, and the initial construction is around $230 million. In this alternative, the underside of the replacement span would replicate the general arched form of the existing bridge, and as a result, the bridge would not look substantially different from a distance. However, views from under the bridge would be somewhat altered. The steel design and arched form is reminiscent of the current bascule and reflects some of the elements of the existing design without re recreating um, the full design. This structure would also require less effort to maintain to, due to the reduced number of structural elements as compared to alternatives two and three. Given this and a review of the previous alternatives, staff therefore recommends the commission support alternative 1B as the preferred alternative which best balances histor historic preservation goals with constructability, maintenance, and cost. Now moving on to transportation, Arlington Memorial Bridge is an important component of the local and regional transportation network. Uh, it carries thousands of vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians every day. And is also identified as a vital route in the Washington, D.C. evacuation <coughs> plan. Therefore, both short and long-term changes to the bridge's function are likely to have impacts on access and mobility. As part of the project, the number and configurations of travel lanes and sidewalk is not proposed to change after the rehabilitation is completed. Therefore, impacts to transportation have been primarily evaluated for the period during construction. Based upon staff's analysis of the alternatives um, shown here in this chart, Alternatives 1A and 1B do not require full bridge closures during construction. Traffic would be limited to three lanes and one sidewalk for the duration of the project. On the other hand, alternatives 2 and 3 would require full bridge closures during construction, ranging from 30 days to 80 days. The total construction duration is similar for all the alternatives, however. Given the importance of the bridge in supporting local and regional mobility, staff recommends the commission support methods that eliminate or minimize the need for full bridge closures for vehicular, pedestrian, and bicycle use during construction. Further, given the potential impacts of full and partial closures on the transportation network, staff recommends the commission encourage continued coordination with local and regional agencies to address potential impacts to mobility during the period. Finally, staff notes that the National Park Service has initiated a separate study of the Memorial Circle area of the George Washington Memorial Parkway the period during and following construction of the bridge may provide an opportunity to address some of the connections and potential conflicts between pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles as they approach or exit the bridge. 
um, especially if a partial closure requires redirecting pedestrians from one side to the other. You can see from the diagram above that pedestrians and bicyclists must, must navigate a number of crossings to approach the bridge, and the connections between the avenue and trail are um, somewhat disconnected. Also, you can see that an informal trail um, on the north side of the circle has been carved out. As such, staff recommends that the, the Park Service continue to evaluate short-term and long-term opportunities to improve pedestrian and bicycle connections to and from the west end of the bridge, uh, specifically around Memorial Circle and to and from the Mount Vernon Trail. And finally, as I mentioned uh, previously, the Arlington Br Memorial Bridge is a major gateway to the na national capital and is an important link in the chain of monuments and memorials which stretch from the U.S. Capitol Building to the Arlington National Cemetery. Therefore, a visitor's experience of the bridge is, is related to physical access, views, as well as commemoration. As the project moves forward, staff recommends that additional uh, detailed project elevations and sections of the bascule span will be helpful in comparing the selected alternative with the existing bridge, in particular, what features may be retained or removed. Additional renderings and perspectives uh, from several vantage points will be helpful in supplementing the views provided through the uh, environmental analysis. And these views should be taken from an upstream and downstream location, as well as from a point near, near the bascule at river level. Plans for pedestrian and bicycle access should indicate proposed routes during construction, including entry points on both the western and eastern approaches to the bridge. And finally, the locations of any construction areas should be indicated and screening measures provided to minimize the impacts of the view corridor between the Lincoln Memorial and Arlington National Cemetery. In summary, while impacts to transportation and visitor experience should generally be limited to the short term, there will be long-term benefits from having a safe and functional Arlington Memorial Bridge. Among the alternatives, uh, alternative 1A includes a concrete span that is not similar in form or material when compared to the existing bridge and does not speak to, the his to its historical significance. Alternative 2 creates a span which is visually similar to today's bridge, but it also recreates many of the maintenance issues. Alternative 3 would rehabil rehabilitate the bridge but the accelerating deterioration of the structure and the continued challenge of maintenance make this uh, alternative difficult. Finally, alternative 1B, with its arch steel form and lower maintenance, best balances historic preservation goals and design while considering long-term implications of, of maintenance. And therefore, is the executive director's recommendation that the commission first note that the bridge is a significant work listed on the National Register that corrective measures are necessary to keep the bridge functioning, support the Park Service efforts to rehabilitate the bridge, and note that a number of alternatives were considered and dismissed through the process. Regarding the alternatives, the Commission not support Alternative 1A because the proposed straight concrete span is not sympathetic to the existing uh, arch steel design. Note that Alternative 2, while visually uh, replicating the existing bridge design, would also replicate some of the maintenance challenges. Note that alternative three would preserve elements of the existing bridge, but accelerating <laughs> deterioration of the bridge uh, over time may lead to uh, larger issues over time. And then finally supports alternative 1B as a preferred alternative which best balances historic preservation goals with constructability, maintenance, and cost. Regarding transportation, the Commission supports methods to avoid or minimize the need for full bridge closures encourages continuing coordination regarding transportation impacts, and requests the Park Service evaluate potential improvements, pedestrian and bicycle connections to and from the west end of the bridge. Regarding visitor's experience, the Commission requests additional information to be provided at the time of preliminary review regarding the design of the bascule span, additional renderings and views, and plans for bicycle and pedestrian access during construction, and the location of screening um, and construction staging areas. Uh, with that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, and representatives of the National Park Service are also available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. Um, <clears throat> note that the majority of the work that's been noted would not be visible to the public unless you're a canoe, kayaker, or rower. <laughs> so, right? That's correct. So, that's an important item to note. Um, the question before us is comments, uh, approval of comments with uh, 
the focus on 1B being preferred. Any questions or discussion? Mr. May? Uh, I, I don't have a whole lot to say. I, I appreciate the very thorough uh, report that has been done here. I think it explains why uh, Alternative 1B makes a lot of sense. And uh, I uh, would also want to express our, uh, uh, our deep appreciation uh, for the District of Columbia government being a uh, co Co <clears throat> sorry, co-applicant is, I guess, the right term uh, for a, a grant program that we applied for just a couple of weeks ago, uh, which we hope will yield uh, a substantial portion of the money that we need because a, a, a bridge project like this is um, beyond the ordinary funding means we have for uh, projects, uh, transportation projects, roads and bridges. So we, we deeply appreciate that. Uh, and uh, otherwise, if there aren't any comments, I would move the EDR. Second the motion. I, I have one yeah. question. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, oh, Mr. Gallagher. Gallagher. No, please. Sorry. No. Um, just wanted to, uh, uh, in, in comparing 1B to 2, alternative 2, visually it doesn't look like one would be higher maintenance than the other. In fact, uh, one could argue that there are more members in alternative 1B and 2, visually. So I'm just curious what that's about. And then the second part of that question is, um, in, in I understand that we wouldn't want to encourage closing the bridge because it's such a vital um, uh, route in and out of the city. Um, but it also would seem like closing the bridge would allow it to be built faster um, and yet that's a more expensive option than the ones that uh, than alternative 1B, which would be not full closure and at, at the least expensive price. So two, two questions. Sure. So the total duration is actually similar <coughs> whether it's a full closure or partial. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. that's shown through the analysis. Okay. So. That would be, I think, if there was a greater <clears throat> difference, then I think that would certainly weigh into the um, into the analysis. Uh, regarding the difference between alternatives 1B and 2, um, this is alternative 2. And one of the most significant differences, if you can see on the screen, is those actual cross members are actually additional trusses. And those are not present on 1B. So that is one of the additional kind of design details that do does add a lot of complexity. In this case, Mr. Chairman, okay. since this is in the public arena now, seeing all the rust and the corrosion under the bridge, I want to know if I should reroute my trips, <laughs> <laughs> or should we tell the public that it's okay, it's good for a while, and we're working on it? Is that the right answer? I, I think I'll handle uh, that that question. <laughs> so. Um, the, uh, I've been told on several occasions that Memorial Bridge is now the most inspected bridge in the country. Um, mm -hmm. w the uh, Ferro Highways is inspecting it uh, every few months to make sure that it maintains its integrity. Mm -hmm. We have taken steps uh, to uh, eliminate the risk of any kind of uh, uh, significant failure of the bridge. Uh, so right now, buses are no longer allowed mm -hmm. on the bridge. Uh, we have had to close lanes of the bridge in order to affect some short-term repairs. We've put in um, several million dollars uh, every few years over the last three or four years, and I think we have another phase coming up uh, of short-term fixes to make sure that the bridge maintains its integrity. Um, even if there were any kind of failure, we're not talking about a, you know, a major <laughs> catastrophe, uh, catastrophic failure, we're talking about you know a section of pavement that could drop a foot or something like that. Uh, but we are taking all the steps that are necessary to maintain the viability of the bridge. All that being said, uh, if we do not uh, repair the bridge as we are proposing, uh, in 2021 we will have to close it. My last question has to do with the little house. That's our nice dining table there. Uh -huh. uh, is there any way we can make that uh, uh, entrepreneurial value to the city to use it in some way? Or is that going to be destroyed and taken away? There may be somebody to be willing to rent that for a special party. I don't know. I thought it was a dining room table, too, but it was, I think it was the instrument panel. But when I first saw it, I was like, oh, that looks lovely. I thought I saw plates and silverware. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
So it, all, all of that equipment is going to stay. Yeah. It's it, it'll it'll stay and um, it's not it won't be functional, but it'll right. it's a there's no reason to remove it. It's not in the way or anything. And, and Mr. Chair, just for the commission, I wanted to note that um, this this touches my office in terms of historic preservation. We think about it in terms of planning, possibly we're working closely with the, the Department of Transportation to make sure that we're understanding costs and transportation impacts as well. So, so on our side, we're trying to make sure all the ducks are lined up in a row um, as we vote on this and think about this. Because the ducks will have a view. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I wanted to add my comment on um, the design. I also found um, alternative two, even though this is conceptual, much more in line with what's currently there and frankly more visually appealing. Um, I tend to disagree with some of the comments that it will only be the water folk that can see this. I mean, this picture is beautiful for the, the elevation, but I think, you know, as, as some of us drive in the morning at sunrise, you see all the arches through, and I think it's uh, this uh, alternative too seems to get more um, directly addressing the kind of industrial design that was originally there. So I hope we don't throw it out. I know we're not, but um, I think it's worth relooking at. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other discussion? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the EDR is presented, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fliss. <clears throat> Agenda item number 6A is the information presentation on the first phase of the White House complex fence. And we have Mr. Fliss uh, continuing with us. Let me just say a word about this before we get started. And is that um, the National Capital Planning Commission has, as we all know, a very good working relationship with the National Park Service and the United States Secret Service. And we work uh, quite collaboratively to balance um, um, effective security um, with a positive public experience at the White House. Uh, this goes, our close working relationship goes back to 2003. We've worked together much longer than that, but in terms of milestones, 2003 when Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House was reimagined, and most recently, uh, President's Park South and the redesign, the potential redesign of President's Park South. And suffice it to say that we do understand that the Secret Service's primary duty is to protect the first family. Uh, we all work together to ensure that security and safety of the first family um, while also ensuring that we have an inviting public space. And so we continue to look forward to our close working relationship with the Secret Service and the Park Service on all White House grounds projects. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fliss. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Um, before we go into the information presentation today, I'd like to just briefly provide some background information on NCPC's involvement uh, regarding projects in the vicinity of the White House, as, so, as well as some of the particular issues the Commission has considered regarding security and urban design. Uh, NCPC has a long history of addressing urban design and security. Uh, this effort is reflected in both our plans and policies as well as our collaborative approach when reviewing individual projects. The 2002 National Capital Urban Design and Security Plan, which was prepared uh, following the events in Oklahoma City in 9-11, was a close work among federal agencies, the District of Columbia, uh, security groups, and the broader community. The plan proposed solutions to seamlessly integrate building perimeter security into the historic urban fabric of Washington's monumental core. Most recently, the newly adopted urban design element of the comprehensive plan also provides policies uh, related to security elements in support of systems that preserve the openness of Washington's public spaces. In addition, NCPC consults with a number of federal agencies on individual projects, including those for the Department of State, National Park Service, and the General Services Administration, with the goal of developing site and building plans that meet security goals while promoting high-quality public spaces. You have seen a number of these projects recently for your review and approval. 
These plans, policies, and coordination on individual projects aim to address similar goals and objectives while taking into account each site's unique location, characteristics, history, as well as the security needs of each agency. These objectives, objectives generally include ensuring access and enjoyment of public space, integrating security elements into the landscape while taking into account the surrounding context, pursuing permanent solutions in instead of temporary measures, and designing an attractive, functional public realm. The information presentation you're going to hear today will focus on proposed improvements to the White House fence outlined here in yellow as the first phase of a more comprehensive security plan. The perimeter encloses approximately 18 acres. However, the White House complex is just one component of the larger President's Park. This includes Lafayette Park, the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, the Treasury Building, as well as the Ellipse to the south. The broader area encompasses over 82 acres within the center of Washington, D.C., and it also includes portions of Pennsylvania Avenue and East Street Northwest. The Commission has reviewed several projects related to President's Park, as the, uh, as the Chairman has mentioned. Uh, in 2001, NCPC proposed the redesign of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue as a safe and beautiful pedestrian space, and the Commission approved a final design in 2003. The reimagined corridor includes new paving, bollards, pedestrian amenities, and furnishing, furnishings like benches and lighting, as well as landscape plannings in support of a space that is functional and accessible to the public. Most recently, in the summer of 2015, the Commission approved temporary anti-climb measures, which were installed on the existing fence as shown in this image. The design and scale of such measures, including their visual impact on public space, were some of the issues that were considered in evaluating the proposal while recognizing that a more permanent solution would be forthcoming. Another important project that NCPC worked on was the design competition for President's Park South. In 2011, NCPC invited five design firms to develop concepts to beautify the security components and improve the visitor's experience at President's Park. One of the most important components of the design was evaluating the future E Street. As you're probably aware, East Street between 15th and 17th Street Northwest has been closed since 2001. Competition entrants were asked to redesign East Street in a manner that accommodated pedestrians and bicyclists. Currently, a variety of bollards and other protective measures occupy the space along the corridor, um, and additional recommendations for, the, for President's Park South will be forthcoming in the future. Each project, including the one that you will hear today, represents a unique urban design challenge that requires sensitive integration of security requirements into a landscape of extraordinary cultural and historic significance. The protection of people and resources is vitally important while considering the democratically inspired design principles inherent in Washington's historic city plan and the importance of protecting the public realm from the adverse impacts of perimeter security to ensure that residents, workers, and visitors maintain their right to access use and enjoy the beauty of the public space of the nation's capital. With that, I will now turn it over to Mr. Tom Doherty with the United States Secret Service for their presentation. Mr. Doherty, welcome back. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's nice to be back, Commission members. Um, staff, NCPC staff, and members of the public. Is this on? Yeah. Speak louder. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, uh, Chairman uh, Brian, for uh, those really kind comments about um, the long-term relationship between the United States Secret Service, the Park Service, and also to the National Capital Planning Commission. Mr. Fleiss's um, presentation, I think, really reflects so much of the, the long history that NCPC and Secret Service have had relative to our challenge to secure the White House complex for, on behalf of the President of the United States and our constitutional government, as well as then also to the aesthetic challenges that the White House should certainly deserve. Um, I wanted to start off uh, by mentioning that uh, we have done an awful lot of work behind this presentation, this informational uh, presentation, and I wanted to thank Executive Director Mar Marcel Acosta and staff, NCPC staff, for all the work that they have done with us in conjunction. 
So I'm Tom Doherty. I am the Chief Strategy Officer of the United States Secret Service. I'm on the, the Board of Directors, the Executive Staff for Director uh, Joseph P. Clan P. Clancy, the Director of the Secret Service. Um, and we are uh, moving forward to doing an informational briefing for NCPC relative to a new proposed fence for the White House complex. I wanted to first mention that we could not do this without it being a partnership with um, a really critical partner, that is the National Park Service. Uh, we really could not do that here at all. We actually have a joint team of Secret Service employees as well as that all the subject matter experts as well as Park Service employees to be involved in sort of advancing the, the, the project. And then in addition, I wanted to just introduce uh, the ultimate presenters to this. It's Mr. Michael Mills. Michael, can you please stand up for a moment? Architect with Mills and Shoring. Ms. Ann Weber, partner also too. And also finally, Ms. Patricia O'Donnell, who is a um, is with a principal with Heritage Landscape LLC, all with New York City and a select a selected group that will present uh, primarily because of their aesthetic and also experience relative to historic restoration and historic recreation. Um, the bottom line here is ultimately this. Um, we at the Secret Service have um, a, a dilemma. We would like to be able to ultimately rebuild the fence as it stands right now. This is an immediate need. It is one in which is a focus of the, the director. Uh, we'd like to move forward with this and the plan is to, to effectively construct the fence by uh, fiscal year 2018. It is also clearly the focus of uh, members of Congress. Um, in uh, the protective mission panel report, that's the Blue Ribbon panel report that was produced and provided to the Secretary uh, Jay Johnson in December of 2014, um, one of the primary recommendations was to replace the fence on the White House complex. Since then, we have actually provided briefings to the Hill. Um, just recently, on April 20th, we provided a briefing to the House Committee on Homeland Security, that's Chairman Michael McCall and, Rep and, the Ch and the Ranking Representative Ber Bernie Thompson. We also provided a briefing to Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, Chairman Ron Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson, and also Ranking Senator Tom Carper. And finally, we have provided numerous uh, briefings to the House Oversight and Government Reform. That's uh, Chairman uh, Chaffetz and also to uh, Ranking uh, Mr. Mr. Cummings. Um, this shows the attention and the immediacy and, and the, um, the amount of uh, focus that's being put on this by both members of Congress as well as our institution. Moving forward, why? Well, what do we need here? The current fence is currently uh, deficient. It is not now a modern alternative to security. We want to move on to a stronger, higher fence, ultimately. Uh, we'd like to be able to have it have new materials as well. At the end of the day, we also would like to benchmark this, and that's one part of the presentation will be, is that we'll show you also to uh, benchmarking models for where other monumental buildings that ultimately have uh, uh, executives or others uh, at high level uh, in other nation states where the fence is, fence is higher and stronger, ultimately. The three components to this are anti-climb features, anti-blast features, and effectively and also early detection and technology that would be incorporated into the plan. And uh, at some point, uh, they'll talk about the height, but effectively we're going from a design height of, which is the existing fence, of approximately six to seven feet to roughly, with that is with pediment, with the pedestal about 14 feet high. Without um, delaying any further, I wanted to simply present uh, Bill, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, the Secret Service's position. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon. Um, we're, we're honored uh, to be assisting the National Park Service and the United States Secret Service uh, on the design of a new perimeter fence for President's Park. The perceived openness uh, and the physical security of the White House and grounds are a symbol of the freedom and also the strength of the United States. Um, this project for the security of the site is a great responsibility, giving it our highest level of attention and uh, commitment. The, uh, 
the goals for the project are, first of all, to uh, achieve the requirements of the Secret Service for security of the White House, the President, the staff and visitors, and the grounds. Number two, to design a new perimeter fence that is an aesthetic complement to the historical qualities of the three buildings in President's Park, which have already been mentioned, the White House, the Treasury, and the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, but also uh, that preserves the physical integrity of uh, the location of the, uh, of the perimeter fence. And finally, um, it's to make it beautiful uh, and maintain the quality of the visitor experience in President's Park. As was mentioned, we're focusing our presentation today on the first phase of the project, which is the White House itself and the 18 acres. The other two buildings will follow in a phase two. We based our approach to the project first on researching the history of the fence and the landscape, and also understanding the historical context, not with the intent to replicate what was there uh, necessarily, uh, but to serve as inspiration for the new uh, design. Patricia O'Donnell and her staff did uh, a lot of research at several archival sources for President's Park, and she'll briefly give us a rundown uh, on the history of the, uh, of the 18 acres. Patricia? Welcome. If you would, uh, introduce yourself for the record. Sure. Patricia O'Donnell, Principal, Heritage Landscapes. We looked at a number of sources. This published source, William Seal's book on the White House Gardens, actually um, worked already on presenting something we often create, which is period plans. Interesting to note that the White House grounds to the south was edged with Tiber Creek, that um, the earliest evolution uh, begins to form some of the circular shapes that persist through today, and this evolution um, starts really taking form under Thomas Jefferson. This is a Jefferson sketch, like many of his, a doodle and an idea, and he is looking at the Pennsylvania Avenue frontage at the top of the screen, the Tiber Creek at the bottom, looking at a segmental wall including the ideas of garden and wood, which still have some credence in the landscape today. This is dated to circa 1803. Drawings from the early 19th century show us that the first perimeter was a stone wall, persisted through this date around the Civil War, which could be a Brady, Matthew Brady image. And the person sitting on the wall there is uh, facing the Tiber. The original drawing of President's Park by Andrew Jackson Downing is in the Library of Congress, faded such as it is on the left. And then the engraving uh, located in the National Archives is where the origins of the ellipse and President's Park come from. These are drawings not very much exposed to public view, but um, certainly an imprint on our capital. We tracked the fence over time. We collected upwards of 200 images, and we see East and West Executive Avenue with matching sides and the frontage on Pennsylvania Avenue and the south side facing E Street. Um, coming into its form that we see today in the 1920s. And this view, which you think is an aerial, is actually from the top of the Washington Monument and shows us the configuration with the semicircular south face and the ellipse, which Downing designed as a circle uh, in 1902. This is just a summary of all the documentation, but basically brings us to the present with this view that we took last fall from the monument again to show those relationships remain spatially intact. Um, the organization of the site with that central view corridor with the somewhat wooded edges to both sides, a number of grand trees are really characteristic of the site. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, knowing that the uh, new fence uh, needed to be taller, uh, we assembled uh, images of historic uh, examples uh, at other public buildings, and we've brought a few of those representative examples with us here today. We, we're not going to show you everything we have, but just a representative group grouping. And um, these are public buildings in other places, and this one happens to be the Royal Palace in Madrid. Um, and this is an example that is between, overall, 15 and 20 feet. We think from the figure that's in the uh, uh, image that the base, the masonry base there is about three feet tall, and the iron fence itself is about, is about 12 feet. Uh, this has a pointed uh, picket design, uh, which is terminated with uh, spears at the top. It has uh, some decoration at the bottom, which we've been calling dog bars to uh, discourage uh, uh, whatever young children and animals from uh, going through the fence. Uh, the example to the left of the Royal Palace in Brussels, um, this is a little shorter, uh, we believe, two f about, we didn't go to these locations, by the way. I wish we could have, but uh, we didn't have the opportunity. So uh, most of these are guesses based on the, uh, the heights of the people standing next to the fence. But we think it has a two-foot masonry wall at the base, 10 or 12 feet of uh, iron picket fencing above. This also has points on the top um, and no decoration on the bottom, which in terms of the uh, White House uh, fence precedent is probably a good thing in terms of somebody uh, putting their, their foot and hoisting themselves up. Um, it is uh, an urban situation there, uh, which, and the building is quite close to the fence uh, with a landscaped forecourt. At Buckingham Palace, uh, by proportion, we think uh, the base is about 18 inches and the fence itself is about 10 feet tall. It's highly articulated, a uh, fleur-de-lis decoration at the top. Again, dog bars at the bottom with spears um, and uh, nice scale, uh, but climbable because of all the horizontal elements. We also looked at a few gates because we have gates uh, in the fence at the, at the White House that we have to uh, look at. Um, to, to the left is a uh, continuation of the fence to the gate at Buckingham Palace which has an arched top with sort of a Sima reversa curve. Um, again, heavy ornamentation, uh, too much ornamentation for the White House because it would be climbable. Uh, the one to the right is at, still existent at the uh, former Princeton Athletic Fields on Prospect Street. It's a McKim Mead and White design from about 1900. It has a very simple bottom rail with spears and filigree uh, on the top. An interesting, uh, one of the closest examples that we found was at Nassau Hall in terms of the relation of the distance of the building to the fence, uh, that is on, on, on the Pennsylvania Avenue side. Um, and uh, this, this fence is, um, has a 36 inch uh, base and is uh, uh, about 12 feet of iron with, uh, with spears on the top. So that's uh, another example, that's Fitz Randolph gateway to the right, and, that, and that's also a McKim Mead and White uh, design. Uh, as we indicated, we're going to be talking today about uh, phase one only, which is the 18 acres. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, my partner and the project manager, Ann Weber, uh, to uh, discuss the, uh, the specifics of the, of the design. Ann? Good afternoon. I'm Ann Weber with Mills and Schnoring Architects. Uh, we wanted to use historic design, historic details as design inspiration for the site. Uh, we don't want it to be a, a huge change for the people of, of Washington and for the visitors. We want to make sure that we preserve the historic landscape and the views. Um, that would be in line with the security plan that was discussed earlier for, for the city. Uh, 
Well, this will be a new fence, and it will be entirely new. There is historic fabric that we can preserve, and we will strive to do that as much as possible. And we want to establish, at this phase, a design uh, vocabulary and philosophy that we can extend to the next phase, to the other two buildings, and that um, we can create differences and hierarchies between the site on, on the site, but that they will all still be coordinated together. As you've heard, the requirements of the fence are that it be taller and stronger, that it have anti-climb features, and that there will be technological features also integrated into the fence, and that it should be beautiful, and it should be durable, and it should be part of that uh, that aspect that invites the public to view and to feel like they are can be a part of the space. So um, the existing fence is on the left, and the the concept for the new fence is on the right. We in, would like to maintain the same vocabulary of peers and of um, sections, intermediate sections of fence between these peers. Uh, right now in this concept, we have, we're, we're showing just a, a again, a, a concept for the top, which is related to the existing uh, temporary structure that was added to the fence previously. So looking along Pennsylvania Avenue, on the left is the um, existing condition. This is a photograph that we took last fall. And on the right is uh, a rendering of what that fence would look like in the, the taller and stronger fence. The base wall and the footings will also be, re be reconstructed. We're showing a base wall which is similar in character to the existing wall, but that would also be new. Uh, this is the existing condition, and you can see the, that there are temporary barricades, the bike rack set up in front of the fence. Uh, we hope that with the, the taller fence, that those would not be uh, necessary. The, we tried to keep the fence as open as we can, and uh, we'll still, of course, be studying any ways to make the site, make it more inviting and more open to the public. These are two of the existing gates on the property, and uh, the, these are recent security gates from the past 10 to 15 years, but they are based on previous gate designs. We know that the gates of this, this design were in place in the 1960s, and the sort of um, arched elements on the on the upper corners. Those were also in previous historic gates. A uh, sort of overview of gates on the property, the historic gates. Um, the one on the left on East Executive Avenue, this is by the East Wing entrance, and those piers still exist today. You can see that one of the historic fence fence designs to the left of that gate, and that appears to be the same as the fence around the Treasury, treasury building, so that's uh, another piece of historic uh, fence, fencing on the site. At West Exe Executive at Pennsylvania Avenue, the historic gates were very open. Uh, they had an arch top, and they had these massive granite piers. Uh, Smaller, slightly smaller versions of those gate piers still do exist, but I do not believe that those really big ones are still there. And finally, um, 
Franklin Roosevelt entering into the White House through the White House fence at West Executive Avenue. And again, you can see uh, that the fence is the same as the Treasury and EEOB fences, but the, uh, it does have that um, arched element in the corner. So these are um, an existing gate and again a concept for new gates. Uh, we intend to standardize the width of the gates at about 16 feet. The gates do vary in size around the complex, and, uh, but for ease of scheduling and other things, we'd like to standardize them. We're uh, again looking at several concepts for the gates. Uh, these are existing light piers, light standards that you may remember from the photograph, and they're they're pretty big, <laughs> and so uh, we we feel that putting them on top of taller piers that they will be, still be in scale to those to the taller piers, but they they're going to go quite a ways up in the air. We'll be looking at how the actual design of the gates. Uh, again, these are, these are concepts. Uh, we can shape the tops of the gates as they were. Historically, there were uh, different options. So looking at the White House from the south, from E Street, as um, Matt pointed out, there are several uh, different layers of security and things that have been put in place. And you can see at the bottom of this picture, you can see the grid lines from a, a mesh that's above a jersey barrier that's placed on E Street. So it's, it's hard to take a nice, clean picture of this. We, we really searched for, for good pictures. Um, but it is a, it's a wonderful view, and it's one that's very important to people. You know, when we were surveying the site, the people were all right there putting their cameras through the fence. That, that was where they wanted to be. Uh, so the, the fence getting taller and, and stronger, uh, still it, it creates more of a barrier, but I think it can still be, be fairly open and people can still come up and put their cameras in front of it. From a person standing on that sidewalk, currently you are looking through bars at the, at the White House and you will continue to be looking through bars at it. On the south lawn, uh, the fence would, again, still be the same. We would try and, and uh, have the base more in character with the base, which is currently there. Um, and because of the curve in the fence, we have to account for some sensors, which, when on a straight line of a fence, they can be quite far apart because the light just goes straight and it follows the fence, and, and that's good. But when it's on a curve, um, if you get too far from the fence. So we have to place the sensors much closer together uh, so that the, the elements that are on top of the intermediate posts in the fence would serve to um, camouflage those, uh, those sensors. East and West Executive Avenues are relatively straightforward. Again, it, uh, we would propose a taller fence with um, but sim the same vocabulary as the current fence with a simple base following the grade, uh, not stepping, but following the grade between, uh, between the major piers. We would maintain the existing gates and, uh, at, the, at the locations, but we would, they would be new gates. But here there's a, uh, uh, the gate into the east wing, and also at a uh, there's a security checkpoint just to the right of this view. So we have um, our our next steps. Our timeline is uh, we're making a presentation here to, to you today, and we hope to come back for concept approval uh, for the Commission of Fine Arts and preliminary approval from you for the, uh, the, the fence at the White House grounds, the 18 acres, uh, before 
uh, you break for the summer in August, so in June or July. Uh, we hope to make an information presentation to the Commission of Fine Arts and also to you for the, the other two buildings, the rest of the site, the Treasury and the Eisenhower uh, Executive Office Building in July, and then to come back to you in the fall to, uh, for approval concept and, or preliminary approval for the phase two and the uh, EEOB in the fall. Thank you. Tom. Michael and Patricia, thank you very much. Just wanted to mention that this is a, an effort at a replication of the design as it stands right now with the pickets and other members. So this is roughly about an inch and three quarters in terms of size with the pickets and other members. Um, it certainly can change, but ultimately kind of shows at least generally the visibility uh, through uh, the fence. Um, and in addition, uh, really ultimately goes to is the both the strength, uh, the foundational integrity, and the scalability of the fence would effectively be enhanced um, by being able to deter both also not only just simply people who can climb over the fence, but ultimately then the full, complete strength of the fence. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Doherty. <coughs> Are there questions for Mr. Fliss or Mr. Doherty or the design team or discussion here? Mr. May, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, no, I have no questions, <laughs> um, but I do appreciate all the uh, hard work of the design team and uh, the excellent cooperative working relationship we have with the Secret Service. Um, this is a very difficult problem to solve, and uh, I think everybody is doing their best uh, to solve it in a way that uh, meets both the security needs and uh, our desire for a good visitor experience. Uh, for those who are coming to see the White House. Any other questions? Question. Ms. Wright, yes. Um, just, just quickly, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Um, from Mills and, yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to standardize the design of the gates for scheduling reasons, and I didn't track the connection between those two ideas. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, that was uh, like scheduling of deliveries and, and vehicles entering and, and leaving the site that, <coughs> that some of the, you know, some certain kinds of vehicles can only use certain gates and so they have to know when people are coming and going. So that was oh. the reason to have standard gate width so that oh, any vehicle oh, can come in. Okay. Any, yeah, no, I'm so, it has nothing to do with scheduling I, projects. Because I was about to jump all over you for saying schedule should be no reason for sacrificing <laughs> the design quality. Uh -huh. So I'll spare you that lecture. Um, um, I think, you know, I saw the early concepts and um, I it, it's, a, it's a necessary thing that everybody wants to to, to be upset about, but it, it, it's what we need and, and, and uh, for security. And I, and I think it's worth just thinking about um, something that had occurred to me where I, I watched one of those awful movies, those stupid scare you movies, where the White House actually is, is um, blown up by, uh, by a coordinated attack. And I was, I had this visceral, sick to my stomach response, and it was not just about the president because he was kidnapped in the movie, um, <laughs> but the White House was just blown up to Pete, not not completely to the ground, but enough of it where I my response to it was really surprising. I thought I was really cynical, but I guess I'm still salvageable. Um, and I think we should remember how important the building is um, to all of us and, and whatever we have to do to protect it without putting a bubble over it is, um, is what we have to do. And it seems to me to, that you have been have arrived after I, some concepts that I remember, one that had a moat, um, and that was pretty horrifying. 
So I think you've done a pretty great job <coughs> with a very difficult problem so far. It's a balancing act. It's really hard. It's a really difficult thing. But, um, we're trying to make it beautiful. Oh, we're trying to make it beautiful and uh, historically appropriate while we have to improve the physical security of the, of the White House. And yeah. so it's a, it's a responsibility. Mr. Shaw. So, um, thank you for your work again as well. And, you know, in seeing the presentation from NCPC staff about the, the openness of E Street in Pennsylvania and the idea of trying to make that there, it felt a little heavy when I saw the pictures. It looked like the White House was actually sort of behind bars. But I'm trying to understand the, the real perspective of how do you keep the security but also keep that sort of sense of transparency because it feels like we're trying to make all the public spaces open and it looks tighter against the White House itself. And so I know we don't want the pit, our cameras going through the, going through the, the bars, but you know, part of what's interesting right now is that you know the fence is there but not there at the same time. And it felt, I mean, I, it felt like we were sort of almost encasing the White House in a way um, to sort of distance it, even though we were opening up the streets and stuff for p people there. Uh -huh. um, if we if we had been able to get a, a good shot of a photograph straight on at the same spot where the rendering was taken from, one would see that the top of the existing fence is at the first floor level of the White House. So there's part of the White House that's obscured. We could not get that shot for various reasons, <clears throat> but uh, we have something close, but not quite as representational. And the rendering is like a straight, I mean, that's a constructed view. And so the, and clearly as the fence gets taller, it's going to encompass more of the height of the White House. And it does depend on your perspective. As you stand back in President's Park, you can still see all of the White House over the fence. As you get a little closer, it becomes obscure or it becomes more of it is behind the fence. And then if you're standing right next to the fence, we hope that with the openness of the fence that it's not uh, something that you would perceive. You'd be able to photograph through the fence just the way you can now. So um, uh, I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that I wish we'd had a, a similar shot uh, for the rendering of, of the existing condition so you could compare. But it's, uh, it, it is somewhat obscured right now. And one more, Mr. Chair, is in, in the seat of democracy, it's always weird to be, to look at Buckingham Palace or other, you know, I mean, that's the whole idea in the end is it's actually a house, it's not a palace. It is the center. And so, I mean, as we're looking at precedents, you know, um, even in terms of seeing the fence be closer to the to the buildings themselves with us having just sort of seen the, the expanse of green, I'm just really trying to understand, too, that relationship. So those precedents seem actually almost too urban, you know what I mean? So okay. where's the space that we see the in-between? So that, so that Princeton notion was actually a little bit more helpful, but... We'll to, try to find some more of those. Yeah, uh, it's, just, it's a maybe a representation issue, but just, you know... Okay. Uh, it's in the middle, it's urban, but it's not urban, and, and that's... You know, and once again, it's not a palace, it's a house. And so how are we really sort of telling the narrative that really is in line with sort of what I think is district and federal interests on this? That's a very good comment. And we were focusing on the height rather than the context so much, but that's a good point. Uh, one example that, that uh, we, we did not show but that we looked at is the fence at the Virginia State Capitol. And uh, that fence has similar... Uh, size and spacing of the pickets to what we're showing here and um, we'll, we'll include that the next time and it, it really does have a decent amount of openness to it. It is a design challenge because uh, um, you don't want a an ornate royal fence. We escaped royalty yeah. and um, and an overly ornate fence would be inconsistent with the simple design of the White House. You eliminate, for security reasons, a lot of horizontal features. So it's left with a, a simple fence. Um, we try to make it 
a little bit uh, mm -hmm. have some design feature to it. It's a, it's a challenge for sure. Uh, Mr. Gallus and then Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. This building is such an iconic and dear uh, part of our heritage. And obviously, the care and attention that you're giving it is uh, absolutely necessary. Um, I have one question about the, uh, the gap of the pickets. Uh, to me, the, the notion of transparency that I feel with the current <coughs> fence forget about height, but the sense of transparency is a very important part of the visual connection to that iconic view. And while I, I probably recognize the, the um, sort of uh, width of those individual pickets are going to be necessary to accomplish the security aspects that we're going for here, um, I am wondering about the gap between the pickets. And my question is specifically, what's the difference between what exists now and what you're proposing and why? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know the dimension of existing pickets. Okay. I'm going to let my associate answer that. Uh, the existing pickets are uh, around 7 eighths of an inch. And there's about a five and a half, half inch gap between them. So that's about, I don't know, one to six, one to five, something like that, of uh, between picket and space. Uh, looking at the, the examples that we showed you, uh, the, they're generally, the, the pickets are quite stout in those examples, uh, but they're spaced at anywhere from like one picket to three spaces for the air um, to a little bit more than that. So um, this, is, this is a thing, an, an area that we are coordinating with the Secret Service to, for them to you know, say, OK, if we go up to six inches, are you OK with that? Well, if we, how about if we increase it this much? How about, so, so that is one of the tuning examples that we're going through right now as we as we try and make this fence as elegant as the existing fence um, and to, to suit the building and to make it more open. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, this may be a little out of the box, but we, been, no, we know that there are all kinds of clear glass that's being put on cell phones that's unbreakable. Uh, this technology, I know there's probably some fence makers uh, will be very angry with me making this statement, but what's, what, why, why couldn't we even think about clear rather than metal that creates a grid or a blockage? Uh, I, I can envision it would be pretty futuristic. Wouldn't be a bad idea for our country to be futuristic and have our fence or our whatever it's called uh, clear. And when you look at it, you would see clear. You wouldn't see anything. You wouldn't see bars and lines. Uh, I'm sure it's a budget issue, but technology is doing this for space, it's doing this for cell phones, it's doing all kinds of glass and making rods that are unbreakable and they could be in place of, and they don't corrode and they don't have to be painted. They may have to be wiped off periodically. But uh, what about clear? And maybe we're too far into the dance for this discussion. Uh, the idea of that has been looked at, actually, and uh, I, we've seen some early schemes that are, at this point, over a year old, that, uh, where that was at least looked at. Uh, I think um, the Secret Service has concerns with it uh, that, that I can't speak to um, because I don't know all of the concerns that they have. Uh, perhaps uh, they, they could. But um, I, I gather it's a, a security issue. That's what I understand. I know that the glass technology has advanced so much. Yeah. And uh, we know that we can buy, as I say, cell phone covers that. You can't break them. And I'm sure if we could get some of those mass produced in, in, in rods, we could install them and it could be very interesting. But well, I'm sure, rods. pardon me? Are you, are you speaking about glass rods? Yeah. 
It would be instead of a, the, the metal shaft. I thought be, you were talking about glass panels, and that's no, no, I no, just no, 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 that's no, what no, I said. No, 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 okay. just rods. You know, just a glass rod that is unbreakable. Now you could they make them. We'll look into that. Any other discussion? Mr. Fliss, uh, Ms. White, did you say? Thank you very much. Mr. Doherty, thank you. Good discussion. We look forward to more. For the last item today, agenda item number 6B is also an information presentation on flooding in the nation's capital and the regional federal response to Executive Order 13690. Can we have Mr. Bernard? Mr. Bernard, is this your first time before us? Uh, I believe two months ago uh, you pre remember. presented uh, DC Water. Uh, oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. So a little bit sad to see all the, the press go. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Uh, I'm here to update you on some recent changes in federal floodplain policy and some of the work that NCPC staff has engaged in on the subject. Because there is so much federal property on the Potomac and Anacostia shorelines, a large number of the projects that are reviewed by NCPC are actually located in or near floodplains. As a result, the new executive order and its changes in guidance have significant impact on the Commission's work. You've seen this firsthand as the Commission has reviewed a number of projects in the last few years that deal with the issues of floodplain development, including a couple of master plans and standalone projects. Outside of plan review, uh, NCPC has been involved with the research and study of a variety of flooding issues over the past decade. So these include studies on sea level rise through the NCPC-led Monumental Core Climate Adaptation Working Group. Um, as well as a number of studies on flooding in the Federal Triangle area. NCPC's upcoming work, which I'll describe today, builds on the interagency relationships that were formed uh, through these studies and represents a continuation of NCPC's efforts on flooding. So this is the plan for today's presentation. Um, I'll start by providing a, a brief overview of flooding in our nation's capital for a little bit of context, um, and then we'll dig into the executive order on flooding. And then finally, uh, talk about NCPC's response to the executive order, which includes uh, the launch of four task groups led by NCPC staff. So when the site for Washington, D.C. was chosen at the confluence of Potomac and Anacostia rivers, um, the natural shorelines and hydrology looked very different than it does today. In the dark blue outline, you can see uh, what the historic shoreline looked like prior to the city's development. And then zooming into the monumental core, you'll notice that neither east nor west Potomac parts existed, but also that Tiber Creek extended into the city what, uh, on what is now Constitution Avenue. Uh, because so much of this portion of the city was actually underwater um, at its inception, it really comes as no surprise that the city has a history of flooding. So Washington, D.C. is unlucky enough to uh, be vulnerable to three different types of flooding. Uh, the first is river flooding, and that's where heavy rains or snow melt in the 14,000 square mile Potomac River watershed can cause flooding hours or days later uh, downstream here in Washington, D.C. One of the first documented floods in the city actually happened to be a river flood, um, and you can see the photo here of Pennsylvania Avenue in between 2nd and 10th Streets um, in 1889. There have been other major river floods since then, such as the Great Flood of 1936, um, and this flood actually helped Congress, uh, spur Congress to pass the Flood Control Act of 1936 that authorized levee systems to be constructed in the Washington, D.C. area, as well as a number of cities and towns throughout the United States. So the Potomac Park levee system is one of two in D.C. that was created from this act, and it consists of earthen, earthen berms along the reflecting pool and temporary closures at 23rd Street 
17th Street Northwest and P Street Southwest. So as you can see on the map, uh, the area in light yellow would, would be submerged during a 100-year flood as it is not protected by the levee system. The area in orange depicts uh, the area of the city that would be flooded if the levee system, and in particular the 17th Street closure, were not constructed. So because there's often some confusion with the term 100-year floodplain, I'll just note uh, that the 100-year flood is a flood that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. So if we had a 100-year flood in 2015, it would still be possible to have another 100-year flood in 2016, though it would be statistically unlikely. So I'll also note that the city has a second levee system, the Anacostia <laughs> levee system, which you can see here. So despite all these protections, uh, the city still does experience uh, river flooding today. And in this case, heavy rains and snow melt in the upper watershed caused flooding here in the, the Washington Harbor area of Georgetown. So the second type of flooding that the city can experience is known as tidal or storm surge flooding. And this is a result of the Potomac River's connection to the uh, Chesapeake Bay and ultimately Atlantic Ocean. So even though we are seemingly pretty far from the ocean here, uh, the Potomac and Anacostia rivers are both tidal. And in fact, the difference between high and low tides um, in the city is about three feet. So flooding of this type occurs when there's a tropical storm or hurricane that pushes water up the Potomac River and into the city. So in 2003, Hurricane Isabel caused major storm surge flooding uh, in the region, inundating both Washington, D.C., but also um, Alexandria, Virginia, which is pictured here. The third type of flooding that the city is vulnerable to is called interior flooding. And this occurs where local heavy rains overwhelm the stormwater system, causing water to back up and pond on the streets. So local topography also plays a role here, uh, like in the case of Federal Triangle, where Constitution Avenue is one of the lowest points in the city. And as a result, stormwater from uh, the areas around it tends to funnel toward that area during heavy rains. So in fact, that's exactly what happened in 2006. And we're actually coming up on the 10-year anniversary um, here in late June. So here's a photo of what the, the floods look like inundating the Federal Triangle area. And um, I'll note here that during the time, the, the water surface elevations on the Potomac and Anacostia rivers were normal. So all the, the flooding you see is just based on heavy rains. So the flood caused, caused millions of dollars in damage to federal facilities like the IRS building and Department of Justice buildings. And you can also see um, what the heavy rain did here to the National Archives Theater. So after this flood, NCPC, as well as a number of other stakeholders, including the, the GSA and Smithsonian Institution, were involved in a number of studies and efforts to reduce flood risk in the Federal Triangle area. So since those efforts on flooding and stormwater in Federal Triangle, um, NCPC staff has also continued to work with other agencies to reduce the region's flood risk. Um, besides our own Monumental Core Climate Adaptation Working Group, one of the ways NCPC has stayed involved is by being an active member of the DC Silver Jackets, which are shown here. Uh, the Silver Jackets are an, are an interagency team focused re on reducing flood risk specifically in the District of Columbia. It's actually co-chaired uh, by the National Park Service and the District Department of Energy and Environment. Um, the group has a really great uh, representation from both federal and local stakeholders and agencies, and uh, in fact, if you look long enough, you might be able to find someone that you work with. <laughs> so that's it for the background on flooding and some of NCPC's past work, and uh, hopefully that'll provide a little bit of perspective on the last two presentation items. So now I'll switch gears and we'll focus on the, the new executive order on flooding. So here's the official title um, of Executive Order 13690. It's establishing a federal flood risk management standard and a process for further soliciting and considering stakeholder input. It was issued by President Obama on January 30th, 2015, and it amends the previous executive order on flooding, which was Executive Order 11988, and that was in 1977. So one question you might have is why did the old executive order need to be amended? And actually the first two sentences of the new executive order are pretty clear in this regard. It starts by saying, uh, quote, 
It is a policy of the United States to improve the resilience of communities and federal assets against the impact of flooding. These impacts are anticipated to increase over time due to the effects of climate change and other threats. Losses caused by flooding affect the environment, our economic prosperity, the public health and safety, each of which affects our national security. So the old executive order was one of the first to lay out guidelines for federal floodplain management. Uh, it provided a process for evaluating impacts of federal actions in floodplains, and it also required agencies to avoid building in them when there was a practical alternative. The last thing it did is it, is it defined the floodplain as the 100-year floodplain, and this is a crucial point, as however you define the floodplain is what affects the size of the no-build area. The new executive order does not replace the old one, but rather amends it. So the process for evaluating impacts on floodplains and the avoidance of, of building on them is still the same, but there are a few changes. Um, those changes are shown here, and they include adding um, encouragement for using nature-based approaches for flood protection. It also adds a national security, um, an exemption for actions with national security implications. And finally, uh, its major chain was redefining the floodplain elevations. So the new executive order gives agencies three ways to define the floodplain. Uh, the first is the 100-year elevation plus two feet, or three feet if it's a critical facility. Uh, the second is the 500-year floodplain. And the third is um, the climate-informed science approach, which is the preferred standard in the executive order. So I'll just walk through the, the new floodplain elevation standards in the next few slides. Uh, so I think the best way to show how the elevations differ is to use a, a tangible example. So on the right, you can see a section showing you the water depth at a point on East Potomac Park. And that's marked by the circle and the image uh, on the left. So we're using this particular location because the southwest waterfront tidal gauge is located nearby, meaning we can be reasonably certain about the elevation data at this point. So you'll note that high tide at this location is about 2.3 feet. Occasionally, a higher than normal tide will spill over the seawall in East Potomac Park, and you can see what that looks like here. But moving on to the executive order elevation standards, um, this shows what the original executive order looked like at the 100-year the floodplain. And you can see it in both plan and in section. The first option for the new executive order is to use the 100-year flood elevation plus two feet. So we know what this looks like in section, but we don't have the maps available to show the horizontal extent of the flooding. We just know that it would extend further than the 100-year floodplain that exists today. So the second option, option in, in, the, in the executive order is to use a 500-year flood elevation. Um, and we know what this looks like in plan because it's actually included in FEMA's flood insurance rate maps. And finally, the third option is the climate-informed science approach. Um, and typically, this means agencies would consider things like sea level rise and the, facts that, and the fact that storms are becoming more intense when choosing an elevation to uh, protect their facility. Uh, so you note here that there's no number for this, but rather a range. And the range here is based on 50-year sea level rise estimates provided by the Army Corps and NOAA. So as new science becomes available, this range may actually change. And I'll also note here that each of these three new options represent a resilience standard, meaning that if an agency chooses it must build in a floodplain, it can use strategies such as building on stilts or having a ground floor level that can be flooded in order to meet the new executive order. So once the implementing guidelines were final, finalized in October uh, that included extra guidance on how to apply these new standards in reality, um, each, each federal agency has begun the process of revising their internal guidance so that it's consistent with the new executive order. This is being done now um, at the national level of each federal agency. So at NCPC, we've already revised our comprehensive plan to be consistent with the new standards, and we're also in the process of revising our submission guidelines. It's up to each agency when to publish new guidance. Um, some have to go through federal rulemaking processes, which can, which can take longer, um, while others, such as NCPC, are merely updating internal documents. 
It's also important to know that each agency may have a different interpretation. So it's entirely possible that one agency may decide that it wants to use, for example, the 500-year floodplain for all of its projects, while another agency may decide that it wants to use a different standard for every project. Both of these interpretations are um, acceptable. So that brings us to the final part of the presentation. Um, so as each federal agency comes up with their own national level guidance, we think it's really important that there be resources and strategies that are tailored to the national capital region. And this is simply because there is such a high concentration of federal <coughs> land and facilities and also because there's a large amount of federal land in floodplains. So with that in mind, we're launching four task groups that will start working over the coming months and ultimately report their findings to the Commission. So each task group was created to answer a common question or request that uh, request for resources that we received when doing stakeholder interviews. And each group is also designed to provide products for NCPC and federal agencies to use in their own floodplain management decisions. So I want to be really clear, though, that we are not asking um, agencies to choose one elevation standard over another. Uh, we think it's really important that each agency be able to determine the standards on their own, um, especially since agencies are developing floodplain policy at the national level. So instead, what we're focusing on is providing resources um, that are specific to the national capital region um, and can be used to help agencies make uh, better floodplain decisions in the national capital area. So the first task group is the climate science task group. Um, a number of cl climate science studies have already been published for the region with varying degrees of usefulness and applicability to floodplains. So the key product of this task group will be to list um, the relevant studies as well as what they address, such as sea level rise, precipitation, or storm surge, and what kinds of decisions that each study is best suited to support. The second task group is the mapping task group. Um, and one common remark we heard in stakeholder interviews what, is that they see, their, they see that there's a new standard for the 100 year plus two and climate informed science approach, but there is no maps that show the horizontal extent of these elevations. So this task group aims to address that problem by actually creating these maps or identifying resources or agencies that can. The third group has special importance to NCPC and will help us decide um, what is important to look for when reviewing projects in floodplains. So products from this group would include a comparison of the new internal floodplain guidance that is put forth by federal agencies um, and also include a list of region-specific questions to help agencies determine flood risks and lastly, it might also include some changes to our submission guidelines. The fourth task group, the area-based task group, is actually composed of four to six smaller groups that NCPC will convene. Uh, each group will consist of a cluster of landholders whose proximity to each other will allow uh, detailed discussion of useful resources, proposed flood protection projects, and opportunities for collaboration. So this could include groups such as a Federal Triangle group or an Anacostia River Northern Shore group that might include Fort McNair, the district, and Navy Yard representatives. So these area-based task groups are meant to prevent things like one agency from building a levee or flood wall that's 10 feet high, and then the federal neighbor next door building a 15-foot high levee. And finally, here's the overall task group structure. Um, periodically, NCPC staff will update the commission on the progress of these task groups and request review and comment on work products as they're developed. The Commission is well suited to provide this review role as it already represents most of the major land holding federal agencies and also includes representation from the District of Columbia. Other stakeholders such as the Smithsonian Institution will be invited to attend these Commission updates. And so within each task group we plan to work with staff of the major land holding agencies but we'll also invite other federal and district stakeholders, as well as technical experts. So both the climate science and mapping task groups will start this summer, um, while the review process and area-based task groups will um, get underway in the next fiscal year. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Bernard.
Where did silver jackets come from? <laughs> it's, a, it's a common question. I'm actually still waiting for my <laughs> actual silver jacket. <laughs> um, I think the idea behind it was that when emergency responders come to, come to a, a scene of flooding, you've got the Army Corps with the red jackets and FEMA with the blue jackets. And so the idea is we're going to work together as an interagency group and all wear the same color. Okay. Yeah. So. Mr. May. Um, first of all, I appreciate everything that the staff is doing to lead the effort here. We're certainly intimately involved in all those discussions. The uh, one thing I would mention is that there, I mean, it, when you, all you have to do is look at those maps and you can understand that there's going to be a lot of parkland that's uh, um, potentially underwater in a 100 year flood or worse. Uh, and uh, we, we are, we are, have been. Uh, and continue to take that into consideration as we place facilities and as we build facilities. Um, but there are always going to be circumstances that come up where we wind up having to build something that's going to be in a, in a floodplain uh, because that's where the land is. I mean, just think about the number of memorials that are in progress right now and what, we're, what locations we're talking about. And a lot of those are covered in water in some of these maps. So um, we, uh, you know, we can take steps to build more resilient buildings in those circumstances, but there's going to have to be some understanding of the, the flexibility that we need, uh, or else we can't fulfill certain parts of our mission. So, um, but we'll continue to work through this. Uh, we're we're certainly very cautious about it as well, and uh, we'll, you know, do everything that we need to do to to um, uh, to provide the services that we need to provide, but also uh, make sure that assets are protected. And of course, we are doing our part for the cause by doing things like building the 17th Street closure structure, which um, was at some substantial cost to the National Park Service. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, on these maps <coughs> that you're, uh, for the mapping, what are we calling these people? Task mapping group? Mapping task group. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that's great. Um, will so it's it's plus two. So you'll be making a, a hundred year <coughs> plus two set right. and a hundred year plus three set. Right. And so after you do that, will will FEMA then come back and um, have something to say about these maps? Will they have to give you a stamp of approval or something like that? I think the idea is that they would be information only, and they would not be used um, in, a, in a regulatory manner. So we don't, we wouldn't expect to coordinate with FEMA. So that we wouldn't expect them to update the flood insurance rate maps. This this would just so, be for use by federal agencies. So I'm asking because in the case of of leasing actions. Um, this is weird to me that that people um, at and this goes to my next question not just leasing but also in in owned assets the the tenant who the 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 tenant agency is it's up to them to determine for themselves whether they're critical mm -hmm. um, and and I don't really get that that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you could have all kinds of reasons as a federal manager to to change, including not being uninformed, which would include me, um, about the vagaries of flood, <coughs> flood issues. But, but I don't understand why that is so, that, that, that the agencies are, it's left to them to determine their own vulnerability. I had the um, same. I was wondering the same thing. Yeah. It, Different it, agencies. Because you could have all kinds of standards. agendas, right? <laughs> For, for for being in for either staying or going and we've had a couple of lease actions where that's kind of thrown a wrench into the works so I'm just wondering if you know anything or if anybody knows why this is so Preston doesn't but how about anybody else well, sometimes an agent <laughs> sometimes an agency might actually want to build a building in the river <laughs> Imagine that. I, you know, I, I've never heard that. I, I've never addressed that question with regard to um, flooding, but it's, I mean, it, it is quite typical for agencies to establish their own policies when it comes to um, perimeter, security. perimeter security, NEPA, all of these different areas, and we all have our own 
you know, legal advice as well in terms of what we can and can't do. I mean, it, there's a substantial amount of independence between agencies, and I think that, you know, unless there's something really strict, and even in those cases, I mean, you know, NEPA is a law, and that, and that's one where agencies have very different rules about how they follow it and what they can do. Um, you know, right. there are things that are, are categorical exclusions for some agencies that are not for others, and, and I mean, that, that happens all the time. So, I mean, I, I can appreciate why there are certain areas where it should be absolutely consistent, but. But, but I'm just suggesting that it just seems odd to me because the average person making these decisions probably isn't really up on the latest in flood science and climate change and maybe they don't believe in climate change, for example. Um, or maybe they do, and I'm just saying it seems well, odd to me that there isn't, this is not something that the, the risk assessment is not obvious. Or, um, it's not as clear cut, it seems to me, as, as, a, as a, for example, a physical security, perimeter security concept. It just seems odd to me that there's no kind of second step verification that says, yeah, so we're the we're FEMA or whomever, we're the people who know most about about climate science, and we're going to kind of verify that you or or conclude that <coughs> yes, you are critical or no, you're not or whatever. It just seems odd to me, which is why I asked the FEMA question about the maps because could you? Um, it won't do, these maps won't do anybody any good, in, um, not any, in, 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 a, for, in a legal sense, for example, if you're a, um, a, less, uh, a lessor and you want to lease to the federal government but your building is in um, somewhere in that murky 100 plus 2 range, these maps, unless FEMA blesses them, won't help them. I'm, I don't know what I'm saying. It just seems odd to me that there's no kind of, there, there isn't a grand poobah of this issue because it's much more complex than a lot of other things that. I think, I think one of the things we're aiming to do with these task groups is, is while we cannot be the regulatory overseer at NCPC, we can at least provide everybody with the right resources, yeah. right? So that you're not yeah, I think it's on good. an individually individual agency basis coming and say, okay, where is this floodplain or what's the what's the right <coughs> study that I should use for sea level rise? So that the hope is that we'll be able to kind of give that give that information out, which will be kind of uh, worked on as a group, and then you'll have it at your disposal. Mr. Dixon and Mr. Shaw. I'll yield Mr. Shaw first. Um, so two rec I, would, I have um, just one um, announcement I think you guys know is as we update, um, excuse me, amend the district element of the comprehensive plan, we are adding a full resilience element to it. So um, I, I, I'm happy that we're working closely together and, and that might sort of further define the district's interest overall in the work that we're doing. Um, the other recommendation I would say is um, Thinking about the in-between spaces, so having been a resilience officer in Louisiana, it's not just about a floodable first floor, but are you looking at natural elements, i.e., you know, wetlands, or we're looking at Poplar Point right now and the ability for that to absorb stuff. We're looking at revising our, our larger parks, be able to be catchment bases as well. We're looking, you know, at sort of, sort of other monuments, but the idea of just the building itself and not the surrounding environment. Um, as we do more permeable pavement and other things like that, just to think about the building itself isn't helpful. So it may be a need to really think about some of the systems that we're installing Definitely. that can address these issues as well. Because yeah. every building will just have a wash away first floor and that's not interesting if I want ground floor retail all the time as a district, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, part of, the, part of this will be up to individual agencies and obviously as, as a group we can provide guidance, but the other thing that the new executive order does is it actually encourages kind of these nature-based approaches. So, so hopefully we'll, we'll see more of that. Mr. Chairman, I, was, I just want to be sure that the staff that's doing a great job in this planning effort 
uh, recognize that some of these comments need to be integrated from the record into what they're trying to do because they, they, they're, they're important. Um, I also want to thank Ms. Uh, Secretary Costa. She started this as a, when didn't you start some of this process of the flood work many years ago? It certainly seems that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't gotten flooded out yet from it, but you did, you did, you, you did start it, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, concerned, that's why I wanted our planning director to speak first, about, uh, as always, the other side of the river. I noticed some of the maps, we kind of got chopped off there. I didn't quite see what the water was going to do there. Uh, and I do that as a National Capital Planning Commission chair, concerned about the federal presence. <laughs> I mean, really. You got all, you got this Java, you got Homeland Security, which is up on a pretty high hill. But we also got our park over there, and I noticed they've been building heavy burns of, of dirt all around Boulder, you know, Java to protect, I guess, from flood. But, you know, the water's got to come further than that. It's going to come towards us and our <coughs> parks and maybe our communities. So I hope that that, and I know the city will be engaged in making sure that is a part of this. Uh, also, I think that people, we need to start thinking about building building monuments and buildings with respect of, of water and the water, because it's coming. And I think that's obviously, maybe architecturally, we need to say, the heating and all that needs to go on top and stuff like that and all the other things that we know need to be probably programmed in the future. My, my other concern is that there seems to be a need for some planning of what you do when it comes, and this is a FEMA thing, I guess, but you know, there got to be enough, some capacity of plan for not going around finding out who's got a kayak and who's got a boat and who, where, we can, where we can borrow a car or, or, or ask somebody to come in with some boats. But there ought to be some strategic planning or some kind of a, a plan that we think about wh how we get people around. I, I did one guy with a kayak wouldn't quite carry it. Uh, and I think that's a part of what we should be thinking about too. What are we, what are we going to do? Where's the resources going to come from? How do we get in touch? What are the phone numbers? We, so we can t find ways to move people around who are uh, still in, in the presence because there's only going to be so much dry land, you know, and everybody can't be on the dry land that's left over. They got to go other places. So something, Jim, about, Jim. Some, something about maybe thinking about asking FEMA someone to kick into this task to talk about what kind of plan in the head can we make. So uh, you'll be happy to know that there is actually a lot of planning for the emergency response, and it's done both by FEMA but also the district um, HSEMA office. I'm not quite sure what the well, I think that for. Then, then I think that they yeah. may also need to publicize it at some way, in some way, so the citizenry understands that there's a plan. You know, you go here, you go there, you do this, you do that. Definitely. You don't want to get up on the tables anymore like we did many years ago, but we need to do something. Thank you. I think that ends the discussion on um, this item and our agenda for the day. We've had a productive uh, session, so thank you very much. We are adjourned.